chapter 2, Luke chapter number 2, as well as Gospel of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 2. During this Advent season, we're talking about the, the concept of Advent or waiting. What does it mean to wait? And this morning, the waiting is over. And we're going to look at two texts, one in, in Luke's gospel, one in Matthew's gospel, one that demonstrates for us the waiting for the coming of the Messiah, his first coming, and one in Matthew's gospel that talks about the second coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And, and we're going to look at some principles that I believe apply to both of those passages. We'll examine the Matthew passage in more detail. Next week, we'll look at the Luke passage in a little detail following uh, the choir's uh, musical presentation. But I want you to follow along with me in Luke's gospel, chapter number 2. And let's begin in verse number 21. And when the eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, which would have been 40 days, if you go back to the book of Leviticus and you read and you take uh, that into account in Leviticus chapter number 12, uh, they brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord, meaning uh, that that was the firstborn son, and that was, he was to be set aside for a specific purpose, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, again in, in Leviticus chapter number 12, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation or comfort of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child to Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now, now you can let your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for a fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yea, he said, a sword shall pierce through your own soul. Speaking of Mary's absolute remorse at what she would see take place in her son Jesus when he is crucified, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And so we, we find this interesting account of this man named Simeon who was waiting for the coming of the Messiah. If there were three words that I would call your attention to both this week and next, as it relates to waiting or in respect to keys to waiting, it would be these three words. The first word is preparation. Everybody say preparation. Preparation, preparation is absolutely key to waiting. The second word would be anticipation. Everyone say anticipation. And anticipation, by the way, is, is part of the waiting process as we saw with the case of Simeon. But as for us, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are waiting with great anticipation. Would you agree with that? And then the last word is exhilaration. Everybody say exhilaration. I, I believe in the life of Simeon here in Luke chapter number two, we see that he had a spiritual life, a spiritual mind, and a spiritual vision, which really, I believe, gives for us a beautiful picture of his preparation, his anticipation, and his exhilaration, yet we'll examine that in greater detail next week. Now I want you to go to the Gospel of Matthew. 
Matthew's Gospel, chapter number 25. Now in Matthew 25, we find an answer to a question. As a matter of fact, a, a rather lengthy answer to a rather short question that Jesus is asked back in Matthew 24. So if you go back to chapter 24, beginning in verse number one, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be here one stone upon the other that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Jesus, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? Now Jesus begins to answer this question very clearly in a lot of detail. And then we come to chapter number 25 because in this particular parable, again, he's answering that question. And so we pick up in chapter 25 and verse number one. And as we're reading through uh, these 13 verses of chapter 25, I've got a couple of uh, young men who are hunters. And they're really going to help us illustrate the concept of how critical it is that we are prepared and how we see that so clearly in Matthew chapter number 25. So uh, you guys can get ready and just come as we're reading through this. Now listen, follow along, Matthew 25, beginning in verse number one. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now you notice that we know who the bridegroom is, right? We know that the bridegroom here in this particular text is referencing Jesus Christ. Uh, these virgins, by the way, are part of the wedding party. As one commentator said, it's interesting, uh, we have no insight into the, uh, the bride in this particular story, yet, yet we can see very clearly what's taking place. And five of them are wise, verse number two, and five were foolish. Everybody say five wise. Everybody say five foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps, but they took no what? They took no oil. Now we find in scripture without any question that oil is referencing the Holy Spirit. All throughout scripture we find uh, oil representing the Spirit of God. In verse number five, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Do you see what the cry is? What's the cry? Behold! Hey! Behold! Listen! The bridegroom is coming! Go out to meet him! Then all those virgins arose and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But instead, why don't you rather go to them that sell it and buy some for yourself? So why they ran off to buy some of the oil, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went into him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, o op open the door. We're here now. We're, we're, we're ready now. Notice the poignant answer. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I don't know you. Say, so what's the key in this particular passage? I, I don't know how you could possibly miss the key in this particular passage as it relates to waiting. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for whom? The bridegroom or Jesus as it illustrates. Waiting for the bridegroom to come. 
And without any question, the key in this passage to waiting is preparation. Preparation is absolutely the key. Now, I want you to think about that in respect to a hunting illustration that I've chosen to, to use this morning. Because here on the platform, we've got two hunters. Now, I know several of you are, are hunters or you have family members that are, so, and I knew in our redneck culture, this would really bode well. We would grasp this. Sometimes in, the, in Scripture, you know, you have to take it and make the cultural context relevant so that we can really grasp the concept. That's what we're going to do this morning. And so we've got two hunters. Now you notice over here, we've got Jason. And over here, we've got Cole. There, there's something incredibly obvious to the eye. There's something wrong with this picture. Would you agree? They're both going out hunting deer in Ohio. <laughs> November, December, January. Now, no, no, notice the stark difference between the two hunters. First of all, I would, I would call your note to the prepared hunter. All right, he's done his work. His trail cam has been out. He's put out the corn, uh, and, and he, he's ready uh, he's got a blind that's going to kind of help camouflage him as well as all of the camouflage stuff he's got on all the way down to his socks. Get camouflage everywhere so the deer can't see him. He, he's prepared and ready. And uh, he, he, he knows there are certain elements that he needs to be protected from. Not only that, but he has several other things that are prepared. He's got a pair of binoculars so that he can see the deer from afar, okay? Oh, he's got, he's got a butt call, all right? And so that, that calls in those big monster bucks that the deer hunter so would like. Oh, he got a range finder so that he can see how far away the buck is so that he can draw and, and shoot the buck, all right? What else you got? Oh, he's got scent killer, all right? And uh, this is scent killer gold, all right? It, it will keep the deer from smelling the hunter, okay? Because now that he's married, his wife likes to make his clothes smell pretty, all right? <clears throat> and, and he also has a bow. Now, this is not just any average, ordinary bow. I mean, this bow is outfitted with all of the latest, greatest stuff. He's got stabilizers and in uh, range fi fibers, and uh, these are not just any arrows. These are... Are, I'm sure carbon fiber arrows with, uh, wow, uh, these tips on there that certainly would drop the deer in its tracks. So, so would you agree with me that Jason is prepared to go deer hunting? Yes or no? Yes. Very good. Now let's go over here to Cole. All right. Let's examine Cole. Now, I don't think it would take, takes us very long to come to the conclusion that Cole is not prepared to go hunting. Would you agree with that? All right. For a, a, a number of things are pretty obvious. Now, if you've ever hunted in Ohio, which I have on a number of occasions, uh, we have thorns in Ohio. And so walking through the Montefiore rose uh, bushes and other thorns, uh, probably flip-flops and short britches aren't the way to go. Uh, because even with all the stuff on, you know, the, you guys that have been, have been hunting, you know you get poked and jabbed and, and all those kinds of things. So he's got the wrong attire on, all right? Uh, he's got on a, oh, he's got an Ohio State shirt on. All right, that's not going to help you, though, all right? Uh, he, he's, got, he's got short sleeve shirts on, and he did bring a, a towel in case it gets cold, I'm assuming. But, but now, you, you notice there's something else significant, and, and you can sit and wait for the deer if you'd like to, all right? You notice there's something else significant wrong with his attire. Huh, he, he's got no weapon. I know he's a strapping young man and, and uh, you know, I'm sure a, a great athlete, but it's highly unlikely that Cole is going to be able to, to leap on the back of the deer and wrestle him to the ground and end the deer's life. 
So, so would you agree, again, I, I want you to see this picture. Would you agree Jason is prepared and Cole is not? Yes. Now, now, with that in mind, I, just, I want you to see that pictorially. With that in mind, let's walk through this text in Matthew 25 and make some, some contextual observations that are so important. First of all, there are five wise. Everybody say five wise. And there are five foolish. Everybody say five foolish. The question is this morning, maybe to begin with, is which are you? Remember the difference between the two? There is an absolute significant difference between the two. And what is the difference? Preparation. Everybody say preparation. preparation. Are you foolish or are you wise in respect to waiting for what we are waiting for? This is a modern day text that should leap off the page to us and speak to us. Are you prepared in waiting for the return of Jesus Christ? Because let me remind you, I, I trust you don't you don't have a question about this, but if you've been here long enough, I want you to know Jesus Christ is coming back. He's going to return. This same Jesus, the angel said, this same Jesus that you see going up is going to return. And we're waiting. We're waiting for that. We're, we're, not, we're not waiting, as many of the, the Jews still believe, that we're not waiting for the coming of the Messiah. We're waiting for his second coming. Are you foolish or are you wise? Second thing that I would call your attention to, they were all together. The wise and the foolish were all together. Think about that. Sitting in the same church, singing the same worship songs, opening the same passage of Scripture, Maybe those who are wise and those who are foolish. Just because we sit in church on Sunday morning, or just because we may open a copy of God's Word, or just because we may sing a worship song, or just because we may serve in ministry, does not necessarily make one wise. I would remind you of what Jesus said. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, hey, hey, didn't we, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we do this? Oh, we were doing this, and we were doing this, and we were doing this, and we were doing this. And you know what Jesus is going to say? The same thing that he says in Matthew 25 and verse 13. Depart from me, I absolutely never knew you. Oh, I knew you existed, and you knew I existed, but the problem was, is you were never prepared. You thought you could fake it until you made it. You, you thought you could do this and do that, and somehow all of your doing was going to make you what you needed to be to get where you want to be. No, he said, I absolutely never knew you. Why? Because you simply were not prepared. Notice as well, they all had lamps. That's interesting, is it not? Now, now, we have to, again, get away from our Western cultural mindset when we think about lamps, because when you read through the text, at least for me, upon reading at face value, I immediately, having grown up in the South, and we still have several... Um, hurricane lamps in our home and uh, we, we because and, and you know it has the oil in the bottom and the, you turn the little wick up and you and you trim the wick when it gets too dark on the top otherwise it smokes so that's kind of the concept that I have in my mind about these lamps that's not the Middle Eastern concept of a lamp especially not as it relates to the events that are taking place. The events that are taking place is around a wedding event that we'll talk about a little more in detail in just a moment. But these lamps were one of two things. 
either on a long pole or a long stick, rags wrapped around them tightly, wound tightly, and soaked in oil, and, and they, that way it would light their way at nighttime. Or a bowl attached to a, a long pole with a, a, a rag as a wick, if you will, and oil in that bowl. One of those two. That, that's the concept of these lamps. But again, there was something significantly different about the lamps that we'll talk about in just a moment. Notice that they all waited. They, they were all waiting. They were all, it says they all slept and slumbered. They were waiting for the bridegroom to come. Heard the, they all heard the cry. They all heard the call. Every one of them, the foolish and the wise alike, heard, hey, hey, the bridegroom's coming. They all heard it. They all heard it. And, and then they all rushed and hurried to, to prepare their lamps for this wedding procession. Speaking of this wedding procession, I think this description that I'll read really helps us to understand the cultural context of what's going on. You see, the wedding in Middle Eastern culture is way different than our wedding today. Entirely different in how it's treated, all the festivities that go on. It's not just a one-day or a half-day event. It's usually at least at minimum a week-long event, sometimes longer. And the whole village, by the way, would turn out to accompany the, the couple as they go to their new home. And they would often take the longest road possible in this wedding procession. The rabbis even agreed that a man might even abandon the study of the law to share in the joy of a wedding feast. And, and again, culturally, that was significant. You see, when a couple married... They didn't go away on a honeymoon. They stayed at home. And they would celebrate for a week. And, and during that week, they had a big open house. Now, wouldn't that be great? Your first week of marriage, and it's just a big open house. And they would often address the bride and the groom as the prince and the princess. But only their chosen friends were admitted to the wedding. It was the most joyous occasion for those who made it, but incredibly heartbreaking for those that didn't because it was such a part of the culture. If you didn't get invited to the wedding, it was heartbreaking. Dr. J. Alexander Findlay tells of what he saw himself in modern years in Palestine, although this story goes back many, many years ago. He said, when we were approaching the gates of a Galilean town, I caught the sight of ten maidens gaily clad and playing some kind of musical instrument. As they danced along the road in front of our car, when I asked what they were doing, they, they told me they were going to keep the bride company until their bridegroom arrived. I asked him if there was any chance of seeing the wedding, but he shook his head, saying, in effect, well, it, it might be tonight, it might be tomorrow night, or, or next week. Nobody knows for certain when the bridegroom will arrive. Then he went on to explain that one of the great things to do, if you could, at a middle-class wedding in Palestine was to catch the bridal party napping. It's part of their culture. So when Jesus tells this story, they, they understood really clearly what he was saying. It, it really sank in with them. So the bridegroom comes unexpectedly and sometimes in the middle of the night. It's true that he is required by public opinion to send a man along the street and shout, Behold, the bridegroom is coming! That's why when you read about Jewish weddings or, or Middle Eastern uh, Palestinian weddings, all of, by the way, all of the 
potential brides in a given village would rush to get ready because they didn't know. If there were two in the same village that were about to be married, they never knew which one, which bridegroom was coming. And so the bridal party would have to be ready to go out into the street, not only the bride, but the bridal party, to meet him. And it was often after dark, and so that's why the necessity of the lamps to light the way as they would make this procession. But it's interesting when you continue reading in our text in Matthew chapter number 24, the stark contrast between the wise and the foolish. Here it is. Everything appeared to be the same. They, they all heard the same call. Uh, they all had an invitation, if you will. The problem was they didn't have the one thing that was necessary to get in the door. They were unprepared. Everybody thought they were prepared. Everybody thought they had what they needed but they didn't. And then the bridegroom comes. He comes stealing away in the night. As Scripture reminds us in the New Testament, he will come as a thief in the night. And do you notice what they then attempted to do? The foolish said to the wise... Hey, Jason, the, the bucket's coming. It's, it's coming right now. Hey, hey, Jason, can, 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 I, can, I, borrow your, can I borrow your bow, Jason? He, he, he's, right, he's right there. Hey, hey, you got to buy your own. Downs bait down there has one. Downs bait has a bow, all right? <laughs> no, that, do, you, do you see it? That, that's it. That, that's exactly what takes place. Hey, hey, no. Because, because if I give to you what I have, I'll be unprepared, and I don't want to be unprepared. And by the way, I don't have the authority to give to you what you need. You can never borrow from somebody else what you need. You can't borrow it from your mom or your daddy. You can't borrow it from your spouse. You can't borrow it from the preacher, the deacon, the Sunday school teacher. Absolutely not. You can't borrow what only Jesus Christ can give to you. And so Cole, upon hearing... What Jason said, gets in his pickup truck, <coughs> takes off out of the woods, runs across town by Lake Logan, runs into Bates, Downs Bait store, gets a brand new $1,500 bow, all fitted to his raw length, got his new brand new arrows, and he comes running back. But guess what? It's too late. Look at it. Verse 10, And while they went away to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready, those that were prepared, they went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. It reminds me of it reminds me of an Old Testament story. You know it well. Noah and the Can you imagine for all those years, however many years it was, some would say as much as 120 years. 
But by what he was doing, he was preaching to that generation, the flood is coming. It's coming. By the way, that generation had never seen rain. They didn't know what that looked like. Hey, listen, I want you to know, this generation doesn't know Jesus either. And they need us to proclaim, hey, Jesus is coming. Hey, Jesus is coming. Because he is. And Noah proclaimed it over and over and over again by his words and his actions. And then one day, the pitter-patter of the rain began to fall. Now, I don't know how many people, the Bible doesn't tell us, we have no information, but in my mind, I can only begin to imagine what began to take place on that day as the rain began to fall and people were kind of beginning to stand around. Man, maybe, maybe Noah's right after all. Oh, what, what, by the way, do you realize that it wasn't just Noah and his seven sons who, who built the ark? He would have employed a number of people to help him build that ark. So, so maybe it was all of the, the ones who were employed and maybe had built homes around this massive ark who in the morning when they woke up, they were, man, what, 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 what's, what's this? And it kept raining and raining. And a day goes by and the rain begins to rise. And they begin to slosh around and And they look up at the ark and they notice that, wait a minute, Noah, Noah and his family, are, and all the animals there, the door, the door's been shut. It's closed. And, 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 the, and the rain keeps rising. You, you, can, you can almost begin to imagine the events that might have taken place. The rain is rising, and, and maybe, maybe they're, they're treading water and, as long as they can, and they're up next to the ark, and, and maybe something like this. No! 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 But it was too late. The door was shut. The opportunity was missed. And it was over. I can't tell you how many times, I think sometimes maybe as a pastor you get asked the tricky questions, right? Hey, pastor. You know, when Jesus comes back and, and all the believers are gone, whenever, however, that takes place, and, and all that's left are, are those who don't know Christ, have rejected him. Hey, it, it, you know, if, if I'm left, God's going to give me one more chance, right? I, I'm going to have, because God is merciful and he's gracious, I, I know he's going to give me one more chance, right? No. So that begs one question for you. You're waiting. Whether you know it or not, whether you recognize it or not, whether you realize it or not, right now you are waiting. You're waiting either on your death or the return of Jesus Christ. One of those two is going to usher you into eternity. And you're waiting right now. The question is this. Is are you prepared? That's it. By the way, it's not anything that you can do in and of yourself. It's simply an obedience, repenting of your sin, trusting Christ, and his absolute sufficiency to take away your sin, and knowing that you are covered by the blood of Christ, just as the children of Israel did when they left Egypt and 
The blood was put on the post, that beautiful picture in the Old Testament of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. That's the only way that you'll be ready. Are you? Hey, listen, the deal is, the, here's the, here it is. Let's put it on the bottom shelf. We're sitting here this morning either wise or foolish, either prepared or not. What about you? Would you bow your heads? Just quietly stand to your feet. And I want you to listen carefully. You must answer this question. You have no choice but to answer this question. Am I prepared or am I not? If you are prepared, by the way, let me remind you, you've got great anticipation for what's coming. If you're not prepared, you might think you're anticipating something glorious that's going to take place, but I want you to know it's not. And this morning, I would simply call on you who would honestly say, I am not prepared, or I don't know if I'm prepared or not. Would you come this morning? Just, just step out from where you are and come and say, Pastor Steve, I don't know. Can, can someone take God's word and walk me through what that means? I would love for someone to do that with you. Quietly and privately, just walking you through what Scripture says about being prepared. If this morning you would come in humility and say, that's me. I'm not prepared, but I want to know. The invitation's for you right now. That's the call. Otherwise, you're in the, you're in the boat. Again, we want to thank you for listening to this message from the Ebenezer Baptist Church. If you would like other messages or just general information about the Ebenezer Baptist Church, you can connect with us again on Facebook or on the web at www.ebc1837.com or you can call the church office at 740-385-8411.